Hey, thanks for joining me. I've really enjoyed kicking off this new series in the Loft, Jesus in Focus. And I was trying to find some way that I could give those of you who are interested in a little deeper background, a little more context, a way for you to get some of that information. So this is what we've put together and I hope it works out for you. So I'm gonna begin by giving you some biblical context so you can understand when we get to the gospels and start trying to get Jesus in focus, really what they're about and the storyline that they're carrying on. So in the next two or three minutes, I'm gonna give you the big picture of what we call the Old Testament that sets us up for the New Testament and the Gospels. So you remember the story, God creates a man and a woman, he puts them together in a garden paradise and they're in a love relationship with each other and with God and all of their physical, emotional, spiritual needs are met. And somehow Adam and Eve decide, you know, that's not quite enough. And so they do the one thing that God tells them not to do. And they look for the fullness of life in something that they grab from God rather than looking for the fullness of life from God and what he's created for them. And so things go bad and they go from bad to worse really quick. And so the next part of the Bible talks about the depravity and the pain and the struggle of humankind. And then in Genesis chapter 12, God calls a man. His name is Abram and he later changes it to Abraham. And God says to Abram, you're gonna be my point person as we begin what we call salvation history. And he tells Abraham, I want you to follow me and I want to bless you and I'm gonna bless you by giving you many descendants and I'm gonna bless them by giving them a land and then I'm gonna bless the whole world through one of your descendants who will come and bring blessing to everyone. So this is what we call the beginning of salvation history. And Abram has a son, Isaac. Isaac has a son, Jacob. Jacob's name is later changed to Israel. He has 12 sons and they begin the 12 tribes of Israel and they're the Israelites. Well, things go along okay, and then there's a huge famine all over the world, and the Israelites end up going down to Egypt where they hear there's plenty of food, and there is. And they're there for a long while, and over time, the Egyptians, well, they quit being happy that they were there, and Pharaoh got tired of having them there, all these foreigners, and so they come up with a plan, and they enslave the Israelites, forced labor. And the Israelites cry out for God to give them redemption, to bring them freedom. And so God calls Moses. And Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. He doesn't. God brings judgment in the forms of several plagues upon the Egyptians and upon Pharaoh. And finally, they are released. On their way to this promised land, remember God promised Abraham he was gonna give his descendants a land. On their way to the promised land, they stop off at Mount Sinai, they get the law, the Ten Commandments, uh, then they go through the wilderness, they come to the promised land, they refuse to go in, they're disobedient to God, so they wander for 40 years, and then finally, these 12 tribes of Israel all go into this land of Canaan, the promised land, and they each find their place there. Now at this point, Israel doesn't have a king. And so whenever they're beset upon by their enemies, God raises up deliverers. The Bible uses the word judges. It might better be translated as deliverers or saviors. God raises up primarily men, but sometimes women, to uh, fight Israel's battles and deliver them from their enemies. Now, at some point, the Israelites start saying, um, we want to be like everybody else. Everyone else has a king. Uh, we want a king. And God says, I'm your king. Just trust me. I'll bring up these saviors, these deliverers when you need them. But they persisted. And finally, God said, okay, but it's not going to go well, but I'll give you what you want. And so the very first king was a man named Saul. He was big. He was good looking. Uh, he was a good military leader, but he was a disaster as a spiritual leader never really had a heart for God. When he dies, God replaces him with David, Israel's greatest king. Lived far from a perfect life, but he did have a heart for God. And Israel prospered under his leadership. When he died, his son Solomon took over, things went well. When Solomon died, he had a son and things went bad real quick. 
and Israel ended up splitting into a northern kingdom, which kept the name Israel, and a southern kingdom, which took on the name of Judah. And the northern kingdom, it just became corrupt and perverse, even to the point of child sacrifice very quickly. Uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, it took them longer. They did have some good kings that brought them back to God, but they too ended up corrupt and perverse. And throughout this period of Israel's history, God keeps sending prophets saying, turn back, I wanna bless you, turn back and be faithful. But the Northern Kingdom, they refused. And so God sent the Assyrians to come in and punish them and it was severe. And then finally the Babylonians came in and punished the Southern Kingdom, Judah. And at that point, the Babylonians, they desecrated the land, they destroyed the temple, and they deported the Israelites, took them into exile. Now this is the lowest point in the life of the Jews in what we call the Old Testament. Now over time, God returns them to their land. We won't go into the details there, but God returns them to their land. And here, the prophets continue to say, be faithful. God's brought you back. This is miraculous, be faithful. And this is how the Old Testament ends up. The last book of the Old Testament is uh, the prophet Malachi. This is 430 years before the coming of Christ. And Malachi says, be faithful. God is not finished with you, follow him. Now, this kind of gives you the setup for the beginning of the New Testament. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, and it's written about 430 years BC, 430 years before the coming of Christ. And we have that period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, what we call the intertestamental period, where there is divine silence where no prophet comes, there's no real word from God, and the people wonder, has God forgotten us? Is God through with us? Has he turned his back on us? Or will he do something new and unexpected and powerful? And that's where the Old Testament ends, and that's what sets up the Gospels, the coming of Jesus, to answer the longing of those Israelites asking God to give them a second chance. Now I wanna give you the historical context. And I know what I just said to you sounds like a lot of history, but by historical, I mean what's going on outside of the Bible, what's going on in the empires of the world. So we come to 430, they're about AD, at Malachi, the Israelites have returned to the Promised Land. And the great world power at this time are the Persians. But within a century, one of the most amazing figures of the ancient world, really all of world history appears, and his name is Alexander, Alexander the Great. And in less than 12 years from when he comes to power, this young man has conquered most of the known world. Now, Alexander was not just a brilliant general. He was not just someone bent on world domination. He had a mission. And that mission was to spread Greek culture, Greek values, Greek philosophy, and the Greek language all throughout the world. And he was amazingly successful. As a matter of fact, because of his influence in a very short period of time, practically every educated person in the known world could read and speak Greek. That, for example, is why the New Testament was not written in Hebrew, the traditional language of the Jews. It wasn't written in Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke, but it was written in Greek. When you go to seminary, if you wanna read the original languages in the original text of the New Testament, you read Greek, and it was because of Alexander's influence. Now, the reason that's important is because when Jesus came, and when then the disciples, the apostles, wanted to spread this message, it made it much easier to get the word out because practically everyone could speak this one language. And so early Christians didn't have to learn dozens of scores of languages. If they knew Greek, they could take the message to people all around the world. 
Uh, there's that beautiful verse in Galatians that says, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son into the world. And one of the ways that the time had fully come was that everyone was speaking this Greek language. And so the world was ready to receive this message about a savior. So Alexander comes into power. He begins to what we call Hellenize the world, bring Greek culture to the world. Now we're gonna fast forward a few hundred years, 63 BC, and the great power at that time is the Roman Empire. And the Roman general, Pompey, he conquers Jerusalem. And when we get to the New Testament with the birth of Jesus, it's debated whether it's 4 BC, according to our calendar, actually year zero, but right around in there, uh, the Holy Land is conquered. <laughs> the people who live there are subjugated uh, to the Romans. They are in charge. So when we read the New Testament, we're reading about a people who live under the authority of a foreign rule. So the pages of the New Testament, the Gospels, begin in a conquered country with an oppressed people, wondering, does God still have a plan for us? Can God step into where we live, this terrible situation, and make a difference? Will he fulfill his promises to us? So that's something of the historical context to help you understand the Gospels. Now, one other context I wanna to give to you, and that is what we can call the covenantal context. If you know something about the Bible, you know we have an Old Testament and a New Testament. In Testament, it's a word that really means covenant, and covenant means agreement, a very formal agreement. And when we talk about the Old Testament or the Old Agreement, usually we're talking about the covenant that God made with Israel there on Mount Sinai through Moses. And it was a covenant that stressed the law and stressed religious rituals and living righteously by following the law. And that was important to the Jews. They tried to live the right way and do things the way that God had prescribed. Of course, it's very frustrating because all of us are sinful, all of us fail. And so there was this struggle. How do we know that we're going to be acceptable to God? Now, even during the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, there were hints, there were prophecies that God was going to do something new, create a new covenant. Remember, we're talking when we get into the Gospels to the New Testament. And the prophet Jeremiah talks about this new covenant, this new thing that God is going to do in his prophecy. Let me read it to you. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 33. He says, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time. I will put my laws in their minds and write it on their hearts. So even in the Old Testament, we understand that God is going to do something new something where he writes his laws on our hearts. They won't be on stone tablets and are struggling to follow some law that's out there, but God's ultimate plan is to write his ways upon our hearts that we might be transformed from the inside out. And when we get to the gospels, I love the way that John says it. He says that the covenant of Moses was about law, but Jesus Christ came with grace and truth. The new covenant is one that stresses God's grace and his truth, reminds us how no matter how much we struggle to do what's right, we end up failing and we need a gracious God. Now, at the end of his earthly life, the night before he was crucified, if you remember, Jesus offered what we now call the Lord's Supper to his closest disciples. And he said, drink ye all of this. This cup is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many. 
So Jesus knew that in him, God was bringing the new covenant, this covenant of grace, this covenant where his laws would be written upon our hearts. That was always the plan. The old covenant, God called a people to himself and said, here's how I want you to live. And the new covenant says to people who've struggled and who've tried to do right and yet find that no matter how much we want to please God, we continue to fail. We have a new covenant, a covenant of grace, a covenant that is paid for not by our good deeds, but by the gracious love and even the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the New Testament is the beginning of God's story of a new covenant that was not just for the Old Testament people of Israel, but for all the world. And we're grateful for that because that includes us as well. There's one other context I wanna give you, and that is the genre context. And by that, I mean, what kind of literature are the gospels? Uh, the Bible has a number of different kinds of literature. A lot of it is what we would call historical narrative. Uh, stories of what happened, who did what, how God intervened, giving us the facts of what actually occurred. But in addition to the historical narratives, there's also poetry. There's also prophetical literature where the prophets speak. When you get to the New Testament, more books of the New Testament than any other epistles, they're letters. And then the last book of the New Testament is an apocalypse. It's a revelation of what's going to happen and how the world's going to end. And then of course you have the gospels. And what I want you to see is that you read the different kinds of literature differently. You don't read poetry the same way that you would read a historical narrative. If you do, you'll miss the meaning. And you don't read the prophets the same way that you would a letter. You don't read an apocalypse with all of its imagery and the way that it's meant to evoke emotion and imagination and all. You don't read that the same way that you would say the Proverbs. And the Gospels, they are a particular kind of literature and they need to be understood in a particular kind of way to appreciate them for what they are. So if you remember from week one, we said that a gospel is an announcement of a historic event that is so monumental and so good that it's gonna bring joy to everyone who hears it and is going to change the course of the world forever. That's what it meant in the secular world when they used that term. That's also what it means in the Bible. So when Mark says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, he's saying, let me tell you about something that's changed the course of history. The world will never be the same. And it's really, really, really good news to everyone who will accept it. So these first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are gospels. Now let me tell you, gospels are not meant to be chronological narratives. It means it's not their goal to tell you everything that Jesus did in the exact order that he did it. That's just not what they are. The gospels are not biographies. I mean, in biographies, you would start with uh, the era that he lived in and describe that. You'd talk about his birth, you'd talk about his childhood. But two of the gospels don't mention a thing about his birth. And really, only one talks something about his childhood, and it's very brief. So these are not meant to be biographies. Um, and part of helping you understand that is sometimes when you read two different Gospels, you'll see the same story, but they'll have different details. There's freedom when you tell these stories to decide which details are important and which ones you need to make certain to elaborate on and which ones just for the impact of the story you can kind of set aside. I mean, think about it. Two people will tell the same joke. It'll be just as funny with both of them, but they'll tell it in a slightly different way. And depending on your audience, you may color that joke or you may color that story a certain way. And what we said the first week of our study is 
these gospel authors, they knew exactly who they were writing to, and they knew exactly how they wanted to present Jesus so that Jesus would be brought into focus for those persons who were primarily going to be the readers of this gospel. And so you'll find sometimes in the gospel, stories are told just a little bit differently. That's not because one is right or one is wrong. It doesn't mean it's not accurate. It just means that those men who wrote these gospels what they understood is, I'm trying to tell you a story about an event that happened in Jesus Christ that has changed the world forever. And that's my main point. I want you to get it, what God has done in Jesus. Matter of fact, I'm gonna read for you from John's gospel right at the end when he says why he has written. And this gives you a good idea of what all the gospel authors were trying to do. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. So John says, I didn't even try to give you everything. <laughs> Later, even in the gospel, he says, all the books in the world couldn't contain all the things that Jesus did. So of course I had to cut it down and just tell you what I thought was most important. And all of the authors of the Gospels did that very thing. Now telling you that they tell different stories or that they say the same story in a slightly different way to drive home their point, it doesn't mean that they don't take the actual historical events seriously because they do. It's one of the beautiful things about the Christian religion. We really do think that what actually happened is very important, not just our feelings or our thoughts about them. Let me read to you what Luke says as he begins his gospel about how important the actual historicity of the gospels are, the story that he's telling is. Luke 1, 1 through 4, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So Luke says, I'm gonna give you an accurate story. I've researched this, I've done the work, you can trust what I'm telling you. But even Luke had to decide what to include and what not to include. And what he thought was most important to help his readers see Jesus in focus, that's what he included. Now let me just tell you a couple of final things. One, the historicity, the fact that we are trying to tell the story accurately, that is critically important. What it means is that Christians believe that God has acted in time and history that God became incarnate in Jesus Christ so that he could reveal himself in a particular way. And some religions, some in the past and even more so in the present kind of contemporary religions, you can call them designer religions. You kind of take a God out there and mold him and make him into what you think you need. In spirituality, in some of these religions, it's about you finding your way in the world or what makes sense to you. Christianity, I mean, at the heart of it, God loves you and he takes you and your needs very, very seriously. But spirituality is not about our making our way, whatever seems best to us. True spirituality in the Christian understanding is finding God's way. What way did God reveal himself? What ways did God make known that please him? What way has God worked in the world so that we might be made right with him and come into a relationship with him? And the Christian faith is deeply rooted in a historical event, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the historical event is critically important and the early Christians and the gospel authors understood that. So you can be certain that they took every pain to be sure that what they're telling you is absolutely accurate historically. Now, final thing that I will tell you is that the gospel authors all understand that Jesus and his message is somewhat offensive. <laughs> <laughs>
it really is. I was uh, really surprised. I was working with someone in our church and this person is kind of a new Christian has a lot of background in recovery and trying to get their life right. And this person said to me after they'd come to real faith in Christ and started talking to others about it, why do people hate Jesus so much? And I, I think I knew what she meant and I asked her, she said, well, when I start talking about Jesus, you know, they don't want to hear about him. And I do understand that. If you talk about God, in kind of a nebulous sense. People are usually okay with that. Uh, if you thank the man upstairs when you score the winning touchdown, people, you know, they're good with that. If you make some prayer in front of government authorities and it's so nebulous, the God that you're praying to is so ill-defined that it's hardly a prayer at all, well, people will think, you know, well, that was nice. But when you start talking about Jesus, it's strange to you and me, but it can be very offensive. And it goes back into, if you understand Jesus of the Gospels, you understand that you are making claims about what is spiritually true and what's spiritually true for everyone because the Gospel witness is that Jesus comes from the heart of God to reveal God in a way unlike anyone else who has ever lived or ever will live. And so you must deal with Jesus and his claims. And you don't crucify someone who says God is love. You may think him naive and foolish, but you don't crucify him. You don't nail someone to a cross who says we should care for the poor. You probably have your heart pricked and think, yeah, we should. You don't crucify someone for saying love your neighbor. You might think, well, you know, tiptoe through the tulips and talk about that kind of stuff. It's not very uh, practical, but man, oh man, you're not going to kill somebody for saying that. But the most powerful men in the culture that Jesus lived in found that something was very threatening about him, so much so that they decided they couldn't live with it. And that was the claims of Jesus, that he in fact was God come in the flesh, that he did have authority over us, that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but by him. Those were the kinds of claims that Jesus made, and it angered the Jewish leaders, and it threatened the Roman leaders until they conspired together to put an end to him. So when we come to these Gospels, we really do meet the most interesting man in the world, the most interesting and impactful life that's ever been lived. One that is full of humility and grace and love, especially for the last and the least and the lost, but also one who claims to be God among us, makes these tremendous claims about himself, and at the very same time, despise pride in others. So if you get nothing else out of this series, I hope what you'll take with you is this. Jesus made immense claims about himself. And he also claimed that he was the one that could put your life together, make you right with God, make you right with yourself, and help make you right with others. And I really think it bears checking out, doing your very best to figure out if Jesus was true in the claims that he made. I believe he is. And I believe that if you'll check him out, you're gonna find the same thing I have, that Jesus Christ comes from the heart of God. The heart of the universe, there's a heart of grace, there's a heart of love and compassion. There's also a heart that is righteous and true. And it's when we receive that heart, that goodness and compassion and truth and reality come into our lives. And we're never again the same. Man, I hope you get to be here for all these these sessions we have together. I can't wait to tell you more about Jesus.